topics and opinions expressed in the following show are solely those of the hosts and their guests and not those of W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability, explicit or implied, shall be extended to W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4CY Radio. What's working on purpose anyway? Each week, we ponder the answer to this question. People ache for meaning and purpose at work, to contribute their talents passionately and know their lives really matter. They crave being part of an organization that inspires them and helps them grow into realizing their highest potential. Business can be such a force for good in the world, elevating humanity. In our program, we provide guidance and inspiration to help usher in this world we all want, working on purpose. Now, here's your host, Dr. Elise Cortez. Welcome back to the Working and Purpose program. Thanks for tuning in and again this week. It's great to have you. This show has been on air since February of 2015. It is my pride and joy. I'm your host, Dr. Elise Cortez, joining you live from Dallas, home base for me. If we have not met yet and you don't know me, I'm a management consultant, organizational logotherapist, speaker, and author. My team and I at Gusto Now provide a system to enable companies to enliven and fortify their culture and operations by articulating their purpose and building inspirational leaders and cultures activated by meaning, purpose, and shared learning. The system turns your company from a flatline EKG to a vibrant destination workplace where engagement, performance, and retention are measurably elevated. You can learn more about us and we can work together at EliseCortez.com and Gusto-Now.com. Now getting into today's program, with us is Talia Fox. She's the CEO of Kusai Global Inc., which helps her clients to maximize human potential by leveraging strategic intelligence and helps individuals and organizations foster connected cultures and promote conscious equity. She's the author of The Power of Conscious Connection, Four Habits to Transform How You Live and Lead, which we'll be talking about today. She's joined us today just outside of Washington, D.C. Talia, welcome to Working on Purpose. So great to be here, Elise. It is so great to have you. As we were saying before we got on air together, you know, one of the greatest things about hosting the show is um, because most of my guests come through public relations people, I meet people I wouldn't otherwise get to meet, including you. So I'm delighted to meet you. As you know, I've read your book cover to cover. And because I know you better than maybe our listeners and guests do so far, would you just introduce yourself and say a little bit about where this beautiful love system that you created came from? Absolutely. So I've been doing this work for almost 20 years. And what I mean by this work is I'm an executive leadership strategist. So I've been working with organizations. And my journey for this book started as a mom that was, I became a single mom. I wanted to lose weight. I wanted to achieve a lot. Uh, I was studying psychology. And I said, there's got to be a hack for our lives. (laughs) So this book (laughs) is really this combination of what I learned as a, as a therapist, actually, looking at cognitive behavioralism, which is how do you take your thinking and, and impact your behavior? I also think about the existential questions of what is this life about? And then combining that with the leadership skills that you need to achieve something, I feel like I've, I'm on to something here, at least, of hacking our lives to figure out how to both be happy. I love the word vibrant and excited, but also to achieve really important things. So uh, this journey has been quite a, a ride. And in the book, I've tried to captivate that and to share what I know with the world. Mm. And you did it beautifully. As I was saying to you, I really appreciate that you really led us into your life and your connection with your father and just some of those beautiful memories and the things that he taught you along the way that you've infused into your life and your work too. It's really beautiful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So as I am want to do, I like to read sometimes uh, direct passages from, from the book just because it's so beautiful how you rendered this. And then I'll ask you to comment on it. So you say toward the beginning of the book, uh, you say, quote, our behavior and habits can turn us into zombies, ignoring life, rejecting uniqueness, defying problem or denying problems and forgetting to look up and gain clarity about how we choose to live. The nightmare is real when we are not conscious and connected to something bigger. Yet, as with all nightmares, you can wake up with a little shift. You can gasp back into the light to realize that you aren't really in danger. You just need to experience more conscious connection. And obviously to me, that's the promise of your whole book and your system. So, I mean, that's gorgeous. Um, that is just a gorgeous, compelling, grab you in your, around your neck passage, Dahlia. 
Thank you. Yeah, you know, we are in a very interesting time. And I think we've been in this time for several years where it just feels like we're not listening to each other. It feels like a nightmare. People feel disconnected. One of the interesting things about working in with large corporations and businesses is I was just astonished at how much therapy is needed, how anxious yeah. people are, how sad yes, people yes, are. Yes. And we don't have tools. I think one of the issues that we're having in this world is that we think that we should know what to do and we think that it's intuitive. So the promise of the book is definitely we don't have to choose this nightmare. There are some skills and there are some habits that we can practice that allow us to be present, to be happy and to achieve some really great things. To I, I love the, the words that were used in the beginning of, of this podcast to elevate humanity. Um, is really, really critical here. Mm -hmm. Agreed. You know, it's so interesting. I There's some beautiful, nice overlap and um, congruence with our work. Uh, I You use the word zombies. Um, I use the, the phrase walking dead in my first book. And that really came to be when I'd be asking audiences or speaking to audiences and I would pose the question, what are you passionate about? And there'd be this sea of faces that were struggling, looking for the answer and they didn't know what it was. And I could tell they didn't have an answer to the question. And I have been a member of The Walking Dead. I know I've been a card-carrying member. I understand. So there's no judgment in this. This is about how do we help. So I want to next, if we can, just kind of now lay out first, because we're going to dive into your system here, if we can just lay out your beautiful love system here, the, the system of habits that you've created that will help transform how we live and lead. Talk us through them, please. Absolutely. And and just to add on to what you were just saying, what's what's so critical about passion and about waking up is I'm also a strategist. So I have learned that if you have a system of being, you will have an edge and likely be the most strategic and smartest person in the room because we are surrounded by so many zombies. So there's there are two sides to this. One, you'll get really happy, but the other side is it's it's very strategic around accomplishing great things, moving people, driving change, all of those wonderful things in the love system. Uh, by the way, it is by not by design that it that it spells out the acronym love. I actually came up with the skills first and then it happened to reflect love. And so it was Perfect. so beautiful. Yes. Um, I pulled it together and it was like, oh, it's it's actually love. So the love system is a set of habits that we practice on a regular basis and it applies to anything that you may need to accomplish. Really, if you read 10,000 hours of leadership development training and books, it would boil down to these four habits. It's L-O-V-E. Listen, observe, align with your values, and engage. And at the, each of these habits is connected to a very critical leadership skills that changes everything. Mm -hmm. It's so crisp. I love it. And then, of course, since we've laid that out at the beginning now, I want to spend the rest of our time together really diving into your system here. Um, and again, I just think it's uh, it's so accessible. So one of the things that you bring to life here, that which I think is so important, you know, just being really talking about listening consciously is so transformative. And what I always say in my programs is, you know, when you really listen to someone, you just melt them because so seldom do they get that experience of really being listened to. And there's something you can see it when you can, you know, I've, I've witnessed it when I've been in in restaurants and out and I could see the people that are really connected powerfully through listening. And so you say, you go on to talk about it will feel like a magic bullet. I completely agree with that. And so you say, you know, to connect, to learn, to access miracles, you, there's a few concrete steps that you can take to actually improve your listening and your emotional intelligence. But first you tell us you have to pay attention to how we listen. And you give us five ways that we tend to listen. Would you walk us through those? Yes. Yeah, so we have these listening personalities. And part of this is what, what I like to look at as a leadership strategist. So what are the barriers to listening? Some of us may say, low listening, I've heard this before, but there's a lot of deepness to this listening thing. And, and we're not doing so well at it. This is what's causing the zombie effect. And this is what's actually, I will tell you, give me any problem that you have. And I promise you that there's some level of your listening that is impacting that problem. Finances, relationship, you're not getting a promotion, whatever it is, there is a listening strategy that we can implement to solve those problems. And it probably starts with your personality. So there are several <laughs> different ways that, that we have these personalities. We have the fact hunter. That means you're biased. Every time you listen, you're just listening for the facts. 
We've got the plugger. These are people that are just constantly, you think you know, um, you have all this knowledge and you're literally just listening so that you can uplift yourself and you can get in there and share something. All right. We have the entertaining listeners, which they're always just kind of trying to put on. They want to put on, they want to get a show actually and observe a show. Um, so we have these very specific personalities, and I go into a couple of others in the book, that really determine how we listen, and it filters out probably critical information that we need, not only to make some real great decisions, but critical information that we need to form a more conscious connection and a more strategic connection with the people to whom we're speaking. Mm -hmm. Remind me what the thrill seeker uh, listening type is about. The thrill seeker is when they're listening, they're completely bored if you're not speaking in a way that's very, you know, oh, yes. excited and they have to be entertained. A lot of a lot of people that are thrill seeking listeners, they probably also binge a lot on Netflix. I'm one of them. <laughs> Um, I'm aware of my desire to thrill seek, but I actually meet those needs for myself. And when I'm listening, I'm really listening for values and, and for priorities. So I have some listening strategies to overcome what some of the natural tendencies may be in our personality. Mm -hmm. That's so gorgeous. And I know you talk about this in, the, in your book as well, and I, I, I do too, but it's just the power of employing curiosity, right? Being generally curious years ago, not them, and I guess that was maybe five years ago, I was teaching at Southern Methodist University. I was teaching um, junior and senior level students communication and things like that. And also one of the courses I took, I taught them was how to get and keep their first job. So one of the, one of the things I had them doing was I had them out going to network and they were like, oh, Dr. C, you're not going to make us go talk to people that you, that we don't know, are you? I said, oh, I am. I am. I'm going to equip you with the ability to go do so. And they were like, you know, so nervous. And just the last thing they wanted to do was to talk to someone they didn't know. And I said, you have this really powerful tool. It's curiosity. And it was so great. So many of them would come back, Dr. C, I met these amazing people. I'm like, isn't it amazing what happens when you actually show up and go looking for and listening to what someone might have to tell you? It's so big. You know, it's interesting. This piece isn't in the book. I probably should have added it, but there are five ways to sort of fabricate love for someone to fall in love with you. And this is even, you can use this romantically or in business. One of them is eye contact. Another one are, you know, shared values, heightened experiences. And the fourth, um, the fifth, I won't talk about here because it's not appropriate, but the fourth <laughs> is getting someone to help you. So actually listening to someone and being able to, to listen for advice, listen for guidance, is particularly those that are starting out in their career, that is a huge strategy to be able to form a relationship where people have buy-in. But it can't happen if you're not willing to listen. Um, mm -hmm. You know this in the, in the book, Elise, that there is a tangible dollar amount that I have seen clients lose because of their poor listening. I had the opportunity to connect someone. They wanted to go into motivational speaking and I connected them with someone. I remember that story, yes. but go ahead. Yes. I connected them with someone that was the person to know in this space. Mm -hmm. This person only had 15 minutes. They went on and on and on, never asking one question. And there were so many verb, nonverbal cues that you know, the other person was getting antsy. And so at the end of this experience, I asked this person I was coaching that I, I took there, I said, you know, how do you think it went? And they were like, it went great. And he, it was so interesting because he was so well-intentioned, but he just basically vomited his entire resume the whole time. Yes. Mm -hmm. And he didn't get any information. So he went into a meeting already knowing everything that he spent 15 minutes sharing. Mm -hmm. So it's the portal to wisdom and it's the key to being able to even innovate. And that, you know, there's another person that I hooked up with this exact same uh, woman and literally they made over a million dollars in public speaking, but they spent their experience with her. They spent the entire time asking a ton of questions and listening. So I've actually seen some tangible <laughs> financial, you know, disparities just based on this little seemingly, you know, simple skill of listening. Mm -hmm. That's a great example. Okay. So then let's just go ahead and top this off with the cherry, shall we? Because you provide in your book, a, a 90 day listening challenge. What's that? So a 90 day listening challenge is a, a challenge of actually intentional 
questions and conversations. So many of us, when we engage with people, we ask questions, how's the weather? What about that sports game? And so the listening challenge is to ask people things like, what's important to you these days? What are some of your goals? What are your values? And just listen. Find out a little bit about people that goes beyond just some of the superficial experiences, particularly those that you're working with and people in your, in your personal life. The other thing is listen to your mind. Ask, ask yourself questions. What's important to me? What am I liking? What, what are my goals these days? And listen to the answers that come to you. So this listening diet will support you in gaining wisdom about people and about yourself. And that wisdom is going, the reason I call it a miracle is because there's this organic, natural epiphanies that happen, ideas that come to mind based on you intentionally spending 90 days gathering information and listening to people. Mm -hmm. So beautiful. Talk about changing somebody's lives. All right. And with that, let's give our listeners and viewers our, their first break. I'm your host, Dr. Elise Cortez. We on the air with Talia Fox. She's the author of The Power of Conscious Connections, Four Habits to Transform How You Live and Lead. We've been talking about the first element of her habit cycle, that is listen. After the break, we're going to get into the powers of keen observation. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Dr. Elise Cortez is a management consultant specializing in meaning and purpose, an inspirational speaker and author. She helps companies visioneer for greater purpose among stakeholders and develop purpose-inspired leadership and meaning-infused cultures that elevate fulfillment, performance, and commitment within the workforce. To learn more or to invite Elise to speak to your organization, please visit her at EliseCortez.com. Let's talk about how to get your employees working on purpose. This is Working on Purpose with Dr. Elise Cortez. To reach our program today or to open a conversation with Elise, send an email to Elise, A-L-I-S-E, -E, at EliseCortez.com. Now, back to Working on Purpose. Thanks for staying with us and welcome back to Working on Purpose. I'm your host, Dr. Elise Cortez. Um, as I too am dedicated to helping create a world where people realize their potential at work, are led by inspirational leaders that help them find and contribute their greatness, and we do business that betters the world, I keep writing books, researching and writing books. So the last one I have out came out in March of 2023. It's called The Great Revitalization, How Activating Meaning and Purpose Can Radically Enliven Your Business. And I wrote it for leaders to understand today's new playing field, which Talia, you talk about too. And then I include 22 best practices to be able to fold into your culture to help you achieve that. You'll learn more about this book at elisecortez.com or find it on Amazon. If you are just joining me, my guest is Talia Fox. She's the CEO of Kuzai Global Inc., which helps her clients to maximize human potential by leveraging strategic intelligence and helps individuals and organizations foster connected cultures and promote conscious equity. Sounds really good to me. Um, <laughs> okay, so... Now that we've covered listening and really helped our, our listeners and viewers understand the, the promise of really listening well, let's now talk about observation. Yes. So the first step, of course, is work, working on your listening. And then after that, observation is connected to something called systems thinking. So I love that. Yes. I, I, systems thinking, I'm obsessed with it. Uh, it's not just this idea of sitting around and looking. It's about looking for connections so one of the connections I made early on, at least, was that there's a connection between going to gym, to the gym in the morning and getting enough sleep, right? So that's that's the observation. <laughs> Get that. It's not finding the perfect diet or finding the perfect trainer. You need to go to bed. <laughs> and if you drink too much caffeine and if you work too much, all of these things are actually connected to whether or not you're going to feel good and be healthy. So these kinds of connections are actually more concerned about outcomes than they are about our opinions of what we think should be happening. So observation is really this whole opportunity to become very strategic about how what you're choosing on a regular basis is impacting your outcomes. Mm -hmm. I just think that is so, so powerful, especially when you talk about the systems piece. I also studied that for my, my doctoral work as well. And just, it, it's so, when you start to recognize just, you know, the beauty of the interdependence of everything around you, it's so compelling, so alluring. And as you talk about in your book, it just, 
it elevates your consciousness, your intelligence, your, your connection. It's so beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. You know, and what I love about this book, when I told you, we kind of packed a lot in a, in a small book, but the whole idea is that you do this and you'll be so smart, innovative and strategic at work, but then you're happier because you're finding all of these other ways in your life to feel great and to, to look up and see how interdependent we are. And it really changes everything about how we live and, and how we lead and, and how we, we plan and structure our world. Mm -hmm. Completely agree. Okay, so if we go on the next to values, that's the V in this. We want I want to first, if we can, you really distinguish values in your book, really specific about values. So let's maybe if you can first start there of how you're distinguishing values. Yes. So you listen, you observe. So you have all this great information and you're smart about the information. And so now we've got to say, what is this for? This is that existential question. What is this life about? What's the meaning behind it? And this is where the values comes in. So values in the book, the V represents two things. One, it does represent both your values. So those things that you say are really important to you and it represents the value that you place on things and other people. And so uh, I know that we like things to be tied in the box, but the V, we've packed in all of the things that support you aligning your behavior with what matters most, mm -hmm. which is what you care about and who and what you care about. Okay. Here's the delicious crossover between what you do and what I do. So I am a logotherapist. I don't know if you know Dr. Viktor Frankl's work. Or, you know, he was a, he's a, you know, he created from the existential psychology around logotherapy. And he talks about three principal sources. Meaning, meaning is our chief source of, of, of energy in life. It's our chief source of motivation, et cetera. And there's three, three principal sources. And the way that we experience meaning is along our value system. So what you find meaningful will probably be different from what I find meaningful because we have different values. Um, but the more that we can actually live our lives around actualizing or activating those values, the more meaning we have and therefore the more energy we have. And that's how your work and mine connect. Isn't that cool? It's so cool. And I think that it gets tricky, right, in this in this world that we live in, because what I think is happening is that once people understand that meaning, right, and I, I love in a, a search for meaning, right, uh, once people understand what's important to them. Now we have to hold ourselves accountable for whether or not we're choosing and aligning with that importance. And what I think is happening to many of us across every aspect of our lives is we're experiencing um, the intention behavior gap where we intend to be a particular way. You know, I'll tell you, I, I teach classes over the past 20 years. And if you have people raise their hand, if you ask who, who in here is kind, you'll have a thousand people raise their hand. because. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then I say, what evidence do you have that you're a kind person? What have you done in the last 24 hours that was kind? And so what we need to do is really start to hold ourselves accountable. Are, what are our values? But are we choosing to stay aligned and committed to those values no matter what? And the thing about values is that we actually need them in the face of conflicts, right? So if someone is being rude to me, that's when my kindness is most needed. Not when we're in a group of people that agree with us. And that are, you know, from our same neighborhood, right? That's, that's where I think the value system can really help us change the way we, we live and lead. And get different results and relationships. And you illustrate that beautifully, Talia, in your book, when you talk about meeting with the CEO who asks you to go get a cup of coffee for him before you sit down to talk business. And you went, Bing! What do you mean you want me to get a cup of coffee? Then you've got to check yourself though. And you went, hang on, what value, what, what are my values here? And you checked in with your values. Then you could sit down with him and have a really good productive conversation about the business. And then you realigned what does that productive business relationship look like anchored in respect. And as you say in the book, once you laid it out like that for him, he went, <gasps> you know, and realize the error of his ways. But if you had just like gotten mad and stomped off and said, you know, you're a jerk, you wouldn't have one gotten the, the probably the contract um, to the relationship that you wanted or the results that you wanted. You wouldn't be able to impact that organization. So I think that is such a really compelling example. And it speaks to what you say so beautifully in the book about how your, your values ought to be a roadmap for your behaviors. 
Absolutely. You know, uh, thanks for bringing up the, the coffee with the CEO. Because that actually <laughs> such a powerful story. Well, and people have told me, um, you know, for our listeners, I, I literally just finished a Harvard fellowship. I was growing my business. It was a huge contract. And uh, the CEO, he just took his hand and, and shooed me away like a fly, asking me to go get him a cup of coffee. And I felt really diminished in every way. And, and I was raised to speak up for myself. And I had to stand there and say, What's important to me and what am I committed to? And then, you know, part of this is about the listening and observation. I've been trained in that over the years. And so my emotional intelligence uh, tends, you, you have high emotional intelligence when you listen well and you can, you can control yourself, right? You can control those impulses. And so really, it's so hard, though, when people are triggering you. I was really triggered uh, mm -hmm. in that moment. And um, but the idea that at the end of it, I made a decision aligned with my values. I feel like there's a professional consistency that is so helpful um, as you move and have many different experiences with different people. Yes. And there's two other things I want to say on this topic because it's so, so, so powerful. And the way that you handled yourself, because you exercise that high emotional intelligence, you were in touch with your emotions, or, yeah, your emotions and your values. Um, and you knew what you were, what you wanted to, to, to do there. You were able to have an extraordinary impact. And if you hadn't been able to control your response, your reactivity, your responsibility, as we say in local therapy, then you might have had a very different result. And so in the process, what you did was you gave that CEO some very powerful, loving coaching. Yes. You know, what's interesting when it comes to values, I think we we either think we have to be a doormat or we have to speak up and be direct, but there is actually a more strategic way. So what I think was so important about the story, and I, I, I share it in the book, is that I wasn't just going to let that go. I had a conversation with him and shared my perspective and why the value of respect is so important to me. And what's interesting is not only do we get the contract, you ended up after that, he never did anything like that again. It was right. ultimate respect. So I set those boundaries, but I was able to do it in a way that that was was definitely more strategic and didn't create conflict. We had a conscious connection and, and even became later on um, friends as, as we move forward in that relationship. Which is the beautiful part of getting to work with people and really mattering in their lives. Yeah. Um, to the effect too of your, your capacity to speak up for yourself, I really just want to call out and celebrate the story that you share in your book about when you and your dad go into this restaurant and are denied service. And you're eight years old and he was going to just take it on the chin and say, okay, we'll just take our, our business elsewhere. And you were like, hang on a minute here. I just sort of think I have something to say. I just watched that in my mind, Talia. And I just thought from an, from an early age, you just understood who you were in the world and what you could do. And you understood how to speak up and you, know, you called the manager over and said, hey, this is what's happened. And not only did they seat you, I think you say in the book, they treated you to the meal. Is that right? Yeah, they comped our meal. Yeah. Um, it's so interesting as you bring up this story. I'm, I'm surprised that it still it still sometimes makes me a little teary eyed because now I think eight years old is pretty young. And, you know, the the story in the book is that my father, I found out later on that he was illiterate for most of his life and he has a very thick accent. And so, um, you know, in my home, they called it the King's English. I was able to speak uh, and and really articulate my myself. And I also grew up with a family of speakers and and my, my grandmother was really strong. And my father was in a situation where he was a wonderful, brilliant, um, but there were some things about him that people did not fully respect. He would be ignored. And um, yeah, they completely comped our meal. But I realized this is kind of I, th this work I came by honestly, because my dad felt ashamed, his eight-year-old having to stick up for him. And then the hostess that denied us service felt uh, sad and embarrassed. And so I felt I did such a good thing. And and I remember at that very young age that I said, I want to do something where we all can get some relief, right? I think mm -hmm. we're all making decisions. Some of them are good. Some of them are not. We get mad at each other. We hold grudges. But I really would love a world where we can um, really thrive, acknowledge our mistakes, and, and engage in consistent behaviors that connect us and not divide us. Mm-hmm. I'm with you. I'm with you. Let's go on the road together. Yeah. It's so <laughs> much fun. Do let's um, do it. <laughs> okay. So now we've been talking about values and what you just said there about let's, you know, come together and connect. I want to now, if we can, bring that over to what you talk about in terms of cultural competence. 
Um, I just, I'm so, and we talked about that before we began the show, the world is so need, in need of connection and in, stop the divisiveness and, and looking for what's right and good in other people and how we can connect with them. And so you have uh, something in your book, a strategy that you call the connection accelerator method. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? That sounds amazing with regard to cultural competence. Yes, it's the CAM method. So cultural competence is your willingness to adapt your behavior to differences and to other people. So many of us are in these silos and we're on this zombie routine and we're really drawn to people that are just like us and drawn to ideas and thinking that matches our own thinking. So if we're going to drive change and thrive and even just have fun in the world, it's important to develop skills that allow us to be more comfortable about adapting who we are and how we behave to differences. So this CAM method is a process in which you intentionally expose yourself to different things. And I do it in a really fun way. I will go to a movie theater and watch a movie that I typically would not watch or want to watch. And I've just been able to learn so many different things. I will read a book by an author that maybe I wouldn't normally read. And so I always ask myself, am I being drawn to things that are in my lane? How do I expand my thinking? Um, there's a lot of research on creativity and innovation. Yeah. Not only will this cam, can, the, the, this, accelerator method help you be more culturally competent, it also will trigger a level of innovation because the more exposure you have to various things and ways of thinking, the sharper your brain is. So everything that I talk about the book, it's it's that threefold of meaning in life, how you can you know adjust and be happier, but then also there's a lot of strategy behind it to, to, to achieve more and to do all the things that I know uh, everyone is interested in in their own, own lives and their own careers. I think that's brilliant. You're reminding me, Talia, um, I'm working with an organization and developing their leadership team as well. And one of the leaders on the team told me something very interesting about his approach to learning, which speaks to what you're talking about. He says that he reads, I forget how many books a year, I think it's 30 books a year, but he intentionally reads them across the different genres. And because he's trying to, you know, become well versed, you know, whether it's, you know, politics or economics, he says, you know, the hardest one, the hardest genre for me to read is romance. I don't want to read romance, but I just think that is so brilliant that he intentionally reads across the genres thirty books, even especially because he doesn't want to read most of those genres. So to your point, it's so so smart. It is my favorite thing. So the thing I just got back from Elise is I was in the Swiss Alps with people from uh, literally. 10 different countries. And it was exhilarating. Here we are hiking and I couldn't believe it, how, how much we had in common. And I just learned so much about practices and, and thinking. And many of us have read some of the same books, but I learned some new books. And so in my life, that is one of my biggest strategies. I'm very intentional about exposing myself to, to so many different things, um, not just for work and for business to understand people, but for the joy of it all. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. Travel is amazing, right? It's like got to be the best drug out there. The best drug. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's grab our, our last break here. I'm your host, Dr. Elise Cortez. We've been on the air with Talia Fox. She's the author of The Power of Conscious Connection, Four Habits to Transform How You Live and Lead. We've been talking about her full system of habits here. We covered uh, listening, observing, and values. After the break, we're going to get into engage. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Dr. Elise Cortez is a management consultant specializing in meaning and purpose, an inspirational speaker and author. She helps companies visioneer for greater purpose among stakeholders and develop purpose-inspired leadership and meaning-infused cultures that elevate fulfillment, performance, and commitment within the workforce. To learn more or to invite Elise to speak to your organization, please visit her at EliseCortez.com. Let's talk about how to get your employees working on purpose. This is Working on Purpose with Dr. Elise Cortez. To reach our program today or to open a conversation with Elise, send an email to Elise, A-L-I-S-E, -E, at EliseCortez.com. Now, back to Working on Purpose.
Thanks for staying with us and welcome back to Working on Purpose. I'm your host, Dr. Elise Cortez. I mentioned to you in our last break that I just put put out another book, The Great Revitalization. I also wanted you to know that I created an assessment. It's a three-page assessment that you can actually download from my website to see to what grade you actually have to the extent that you're actually meeting today's uh, workforce needs and interests. It's at both EliseCortez.com and Gusto-Now.com. If you are just joining us now, my guest is Talia Fox. She's the CEO of Kuzai Global Inc., which helps her clients to maximize human potential by leveraging strategic intelligence and helps individuals and organizations foster connected cultures, promote conscious equity. So, all right, Talia, for this last bit here, I wanted to get a little bit further into the engagement. Before we do, I really want to present um, just something really beautiful about your your book. Um, just, again, the promise of, of this structure here and this idea of how love really harnesses the power to engage in the world, your family, your community, and your work. Um, I think what I know from my work is that people crave connection. They want to know they matter. They want to know that their lives are worthwhile. And so I really see your system as a way to really catalyze, vitalize, and activate that. So just want to, again, speak to the, the promise of your book before we get into the engage part. Thank you so much. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting because some of us also are looking for love in all the wrong places. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. We want to feel that we matter. We want to um, align with our values. We really want to be happy. We want to make great choices that 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 breed contentment. Um, you know, they're, they're, we want connection. The thing is, we may not be able to get that from everyone in the world because we are living among, uh, unfortunately, zombies, people that aren't looking up. And so with this system, the love system, not only is it a way to step up and really be the leader of connection, if you are the if you are the model of, of how we can listen, how we can observe, how we can align with our values and engage, you begin to be the accelerator and the exponential impact on other people. And in turn, you will get that love and get your needs met. But if we're constantly trying to get other people to give it to us, we're off the mark. Mm. So we've got to make sure that we're finding our people and our clusters to be able to love uh, without the need for other people to, to be in agreement or to do the same things. Mm -hmm. Completely agree. Completely align on that. Okay, so now let's hit the, the last ha habit here around engaging. And I really appreciate that a part of what you, you talk about here, which we hit upon a little bit when we were talking about observation, but you talk about how engaging includes developing the capacity for asking really good provocative questions. And I, I completely agree with you that the, the quality of your questions, not the quality of your answers as you distinguish in the book is really critical. So talk to us a little bit about engaging and developing this capacity to be provocative in our questions. Yes. So you've listened, you observed, you've got this great information, you know what's important to you. So now it's time to go out into the world and connect. And so the skill that we need is to increase our capacity to have great social skills and to communicate effectively. Uh, part of that communication is how do you ask questions that give you more information, that engage people, and that uh, create environments and communities where we are really connecting in a conscious way, right? So asking questions like, you know, what's happening here? What's not happening here? Asking questions, what are the opportunities that we have together? Um, what are the key goals? There are so many different things that we can ask that go beyond just those surface questions that allow us to engage. The key here is that we need to be able to practice and plan how we communicate. And many of us communicate just like with the listening. We just have a habit of how we communicate. We don't think about our pauses. We don't have a, a structure in the book. I give you an outline and questions to ask. We just kind of go out and we just wing it. It's fine to have those moments, but we want to take our listening, our observations, and our values to actually develop a communication strategy that's engaging, and our connections will be more meaningful, and our impact will be more meaningful. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I want to take it one step further because I think this is so great for anybody that's listening who is a leader or aspiring to be a leader. And, and what you talk about here with regard to asking the right questions is you talk about how great leaders make rich connections by being great listeners and curious observers, honing their humility and inspiring action. But when they when they ask the right questions of their team, they enroll the team because they're asking them for their from for their ideas, their own input. They're not just telling them what to do. 
which is not something that it that motivates or inspires people. And so that ability to ask those kind of questions and really get people involved and committed and on board is so, so powerful. Absolutely. I call it, you know, I'm I'm looking at the book here now. I, I really have enjoyed this, writing this book and just, just pull, pulling it together. But I'm thinking about the, we have a chapter called The Million Dollar Leader. And in that chapter, it's literally about, do you ask the question, how can we leverage our collective skills? Um, what are we willing to do to reach this goal? What are we not willing to do to reach this goal? How do we encourage innovative and creative thinking? I think sometimes we want to get straight to the answers, but we forget that there is a lot of wisdom and connection in the journey, right? To the end of the, we just want to hop to it. Give me your information. Give me your brief. But have you asked the right questions? And have you really done an assessment as to where people are in terms of how motivated they are, how much energy they have? And what I find that when you stop to ask these kinds of provocative questions, the path and the strategy changes because you know a little bit more about how to go about solving some pretty big issues that lots of organizations have. Mm -hmm. So, so, so powerful. And the other thing that we know, of course, this show has been on, on air for almost nine years. So I've had a lot of people coming on and talking about the, the how leadership is evolving. And what we definitely know is that leaders can't do it alone. They, the world is way too complex. They need to solicit the input, the ideas, the commitment of everybody on the team. And so what you're describing is a beautiful way to do that. And yeah, I mean, I think the the bottom line is what do you do when you don't know what to do, right? <laughs> and you ask questions. And then the other thing about these provocative questions is that many of us are still relying on outdated information. And so we're making a lot of assumptions. And until yes. the question has been asked, um, it's it's an assumption until the question's been asked. And so many people, it's funny, I, I talk to clients all the time. This is something I'm, I'm going to say, I, I would say off record, but it's on record. The clients <laughs> are going to hear this at this point. Um, many of my clients give me a whole you know, a whole mouthful about their interpretation or assumptions about the organization. And I secretly tell my team, take it all with a grain of salt because they haven't asked the questions. I really dig in to see where that information's coming from. And sometimes it's just outdated rumors that have been going around in an organization for many years and there's not a lot of teeth in it. They're just opinions. And so asking these questions really helps us get to reality and get to truth so that our strategies will actually work. Mm. So good. And, you know, and we all need this kind of help. And the other thing I want to distinguish about your, your system um, that is will be interesting in, in juxtaposition against next week's show with Ed Hess. He's talking about really you know, developing your person so that you can make it in the, today's world of smart technology and remain employable, desirable in the world of work, et cetera. And one of those ways, of course, is to become uh, more human right? And to become, you know, a more, more emotionally intelligent, which is a part of what you're talking about as well. So there's a real, there's real utility in this. It used to be when I first started doing this, maybe you too, is what we're talking about in many ways would be considered what, what used to be called soft skills. And those things that we don't talk about that at all anymore. We never refer to the stuff as soft skills anymore. In fact, I could almost say that what you and I teach is the hard skills of yeah, actually making really it in today's world today. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting because technology is constantly changing and because nobody is as smart as we once were because we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, these skills of connection are really going to be the only thing that matters because the ability to predict the future has been hindered. So you were really smart because you have all this experience. And so you really could do a whole lot. But now the, the whole game has changed. We don't know next week. Um, what's going to happen. And so we need that leader. It's, it's the, I kind of start to dance when I do this, but it's the, um, it's the foundation of being ag agile. The, the agility is critical and the human piece of us is what allows that agility. Mm -hmm. Completely, yeah. completely aligned with you on that. Yeah. One of the things that you did in the book, just at the beginning that I thought was so powerful, and I want you to kind of talk about this here for our listeners and viewers who haven't seen this is, 
you have developed this powerful reframing exercise that you teach and conduct in your workshops. And you, and I'll quote from your book, you say the, sh the, the shift that you're trying to help people with, the shift is the art of reframing our perspective to get the energy we need to engage, practice speaking about your life in terms of the things you love, things that make you happy, and things that promote your values rather than your misfortunes. So you have this really powerful exercise that you take people through on stage. Can you share that? Yes. So just to give some context, the reason I created The Art of the Shift is because adults actually are very sensitive. And I think we get sad and our feelings get hurt pretty easily and we can get very discouraged. And I don't think that we like to talk about how much that discouragement and the sadness and the disappointment impacts our the way that we show up and the decisions that we make uh, at work and in our lives. We're, we kind of have this thing, you're an adult, so you're supposed to, you're a professional, you've been doing this for a long time, and so you're just supposed to deal with it. Um, but people aren't dealing with it as well as, as one might think. So the art of the shift is based on the principle that if you are energized and you're feeling good and you have a different way of perceiving your life and your experience that you are going to engage in a, in a way that is totally energized and much more connected. And so what this is, I take people up on stage. It's very popular and I, I love it. I actually have people that call me offline saying, can I have a shift? I just need a shift. <laughs> oh, please give me a shift. Um, I actually taught my sister how to do this because I was like, someone needs to shift me. And so she, she shifts me sometimes. But what this is, is if you share with me your three most important values. That's all I need to know. And then tell me a challenge that you are experiencing. I will almost kind of like that movie Freaky Friday, jump into your head and give you a line of thinking that supports feeling better, feeling more energized, and even supports your brain and getting online, that frontal cortex, you probably have talked about that on the show, so you're not having mm -hmm. the amygdala attack, getting that frontal cortex online so that you can begin to think strategically and clearly about what your next steps can be. And I've actually seen miracles with this shift. I've been doing it maybe for 15 years, and um it is one of my favorite tools that I use with leaders and, and people actually all, all over the world. Mm -hmm. I do something with an, an identity shift too. That's really, really powerful. So I really, really relate to that. It's just so, so, and you, people can't necessarily do this by themselves. They need a little bit of, you know, Talia drop in or divine drop in. So incredible. All right. We're almost out of time, but I do want to give you just a, an opportunity just to, if you can share, say in about a minute, maybe or a minute and a half, I want to it, just let our listeners and viewers understand, you know, what your work looks like. So when you go into an organization, you know, can you give us an example of how, when, what were, what was the organization up against? What were, what were they trying to accomplish and how did working with you and your team actually make a difference? So we have helped transform really complex, big organizations. Um, from a consulting side, we go in and we do listening sessions. We observe what's really happening. We see what the values are, and then we engage the entire organization in change. And so many of our organizations have dealt with a lot of diversity, equity, and inclusion issues. Many of our organizations have dealt with, with actually hemorrhaging people and leaders. And so this one particular organization that we use the love system around and develop trainings, before they had a ton of conflict, people were quitting, they weren't sure what was going on. After um, they developed communities of practice, uh, people were signed up and had waiting lists to engage in learning experiences. Um, there was literally someone that wrote a letter saying that she worked at the organization for 30 years and she, she was on her way to quitting and she's never been happier than, than the last six weeks. And it was literally doing, I call it a culture shot of love, right? Uh, going in and getting to the root of what matters for people and consciously connecting people. And it really drives outcomes and drives results. Mm -hmm. Really beautiful work. Okay. So we, we have managed to get to the end of the show already. You know, the show is listened to by people around the world who care about elevating the workplace, elevating the experience of work, creating those cultures where people are led by inspirational leaders. We do business that betters the world. What would you like to leave them with? I'd like to leave you with this idea that happiness and fun absolutely matter. And for all of us that are dedicating our lives to helping other people, that it really starts with us. 
making sure that you're shifted and you're ready so that you can see the opportunities that that lie in in our experiences with other people. So starting starting with us, uh, Elise, you and I making sure we're right and then we can elevate humanity. So really important. I'm with you, Talia. I'm so grateful our paths have crossed. I, I loved your book. Thank you for coming on Working on Purpose to share your beautiful perspective, ideas, and and your four habits of love. Thank you so Thank much, you. Talia. I'm going to grab your book too, Elise. I'm so excited to know you. And likewise, likewise. And listeners and viewers, you're going to want to learn more about this woman, Talia Fox, and the work she and her team do at Kusai. Um, you also want to check out her book, The Power of Conscious Connection. You can start just by going to her website. It's Kusai Training. Let me spell that for you. It's K-U-S-I Training, KusaiTraining.com. Last week, if you missed the live show, you can always catch it via recorded podcast. We were on the air with Michael Levy, who's the CEO of WorkProud, an online engagement and recognition platform. We talked about the importance and ways companies can recognize the contributions of their people and how doing so activates the, their sense of belonging and desire to contribute. Next week, we'll be on the air with Ed Hess talking about his latest book, Own Your Work Journey, A Path to Meaningful Work and Happiness in the Age of Smart Technology and Radical Change. See you there. Remember, work is one of the best adventures and means of realizing our potential and making the impact we crave. So let's work on purpose. We hope you've enjoyed this week's program. Be sure to tune into Working on Purpose, featuring your host, Dr. Elise Cortez, each week on W4CY. Together, we'll create a world where business operates conscientiously, leadership inspires and passion performance, and employees are fulfilled in work that provides the meaning and purpose they crave. See you there. Let's work on purpose.